Ooh. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Thank you for choosing to spend the next hour with us talking about two awesome technologies working together. Today with us, we have Chris from Microsoft, Danny, Marius, and myself from Databricks. Collectively, we will cover the best practices for Power BI on top of Databricks. Um, hopefully, coming from Power BI background or Databricks background, you have heard at least some of us. But uh, in order to cover everybody, we'll let the speakers introduce themselves. First off is Chris. Hi there, my name is Chris Webb. I work at Microsoft on the Fabric Customer Advisory Team, which used to be called the Power BI Customer Advisory Team. It's the same job with a new name. Um, and I spend a lot of my time advising customers how to be successful with Power BI, in particular, um, dealing with uh, issues like direct query versus import mode, which we'll be talking about a lot today. Benny? Hey everybody, my name is Danny Lee. I'm a, I'm actually a former SQL Server AS guy. That's actually why Chris and I are old, old, old friends. So implying the the fact that we're old people now. Uh, but here to actually more talk from the uh, Power BI to Delta perspective. And so I'm glad to be here. Glad to answer some questions. Marius. Hello everyone. My name is Marius Panga. I'm a solutions architect with Databricks with, with a passion for, for Power BI since my old uh, Microsoft days. Quite excited to be here. Hi guys. My name is Li Ping. I also came from Microsoft, currently working for Databricks, and I do a lot of uh, YouTube blogs on both technologies. So again, excited to be here and sharing the best practices. In terms of the agenda today, Chris is going to cover the uh, Power BI performance tips. Then you will cover the best practices in terms of setting up your Delta Lake. Marius will cover the tips and tricks for DB SQL. And I will cover the consideration for security when it comes to Power BI on top of Databricks. So without further ado, I'm going to give control over to Chris and he will start off with Power BI. Chris, you have control. Right. Thank you very much. So from a Power BI point of view, uh, there are a couple of things to take into account. Uh, Leaving, do you want to go on to the next slide? Uh, yeah, oh. you should be able to do or, it with your arrow uh, key or yes. on your screen. Yeah. There we go. All right. Thank you. So the first and the most important decision you'll make about the performance of your Power BI reports on top of Databricks is the choice of whether you're going to use import mode or direct query mode. Now, there isn't a right choice, and there are a number of things you need to take into account when you're um, making this decision. Generally speaking, we always say at Microsoft that you should use import mode unless you've got a good reason to use direct query mode. But I suspect for Databricks customers, it is perhaps more likely than average that you'll end up using direct query mode. Now, import mode involves taking a copy of your data and copying it into Power BI's own in-memory column store database engine so that when your reports run, the reports get their data from that cached in-memory copy of the data. That's great. Uh, there are two main downsides. First of all, it takes some time to copy the data across to Power BI's own in-memory database engine. And then when the data in the source changes, well, guess what? You've got to copy the data all over across again. Now, for smelly, fairly small data volumes, that's not going to be an issue. Or for data which doesn't change very frequently, that's fine. If you're talking about larger data volumes, perhaps hundreds of millions of rows and beyond, then copying the data across can take some time. There are tricks you can use, including incremental refresh, um, but that takes a little bit more thought. And if your data changes frequently again, well, then you're going to be doing that copy across rather more frequently. So the alternative is direct query mode. In direct query mode, no data gets stored inside your Power BI semantic model. When your report runs, Power BI generates one or more SQL queries against your um, Databricks data. Now, that means that you get 
no, wait for the data to be refreshed. And when the data changes in Databricks, the data in your report gets updated. It also means that there is more work on the Power BI side that needs to be done in order to generate SQL queries, get the data back, stitch it all back together. And there can be some inefficiencies that get introduced on the Power BI side and indeed on the Databricks side, which mean that it's up to you to do a bit more tuning and really understand what's going on. Um, I would say that it is absolutely possible to get great performance with direct query mode. The point is you need to know what you're doing and it becomes more and more important to follow the best practices to get that great performance. So the question is, what are the good practices? And to be honest, a lot of what I'm gonna say applies to both import mode and direct query mode. Generally speaking with import mode, unless you're working with generally large data volumes, things just work. But the second and perhaps most important best practice for any Power BI project, not just with Databricks and not just with uh, regard to import mode and direct query mode, is how you model your data. Power BI loves star schemas, and that is true of import mode as well as direct query mode. If you just take your data, however it's modeled, and put it into Power BI, yeah, it might just work, but there is more of a chance you're gonna end up with problems. Star schemas are the way to go. And I know about all of the arguments that you might get into about the merits of star schemas versus, versus the uh, big wide flat tables. The answer is still star schemas with Power BI. Trust me on this. I could talk for an hour about the reasons why star schemas are better for Power BI, but you really, really want to have a star schema. So are you saying star schema? I can't tell, Chris, if you wanted that. Perhaps, perhaps. Or maybe okay. I'm not yeah. clear enough. Use the star yeah, yeah. schema. So Oh, got it, got it. I just want to make sure. That's all. Sorry, my bad. And I know it. I know it can be quite a lot of effort if you've got that big wide flat table from some other BI tool you might have been using in the past. Um, but trust me, it's worth taking the time to build your star scheme. Now, next up, um, talk, talked about import mode versus direct query, but it's not an either or choice. Um, you can mix and match using import mode and direct query inside the same model. And this is what we talk about when we talk about composite models. Some tables can be import mode. Some tables can be direct query mode. You can even use something called dual mode, which allows you to switch between composite, uh, import mode and direct query mode at the same table. You can have aggregation tables, which the Power BI engine knows to use and, and query transparently. They can be in import mode or direct query mode. You can even have tables where some of the data is in import mode and some is in direct query mode. Those are called hybrid tables. So making the choice between you know, import mode and direct query mode, even at the table level, can make a massive difference. Beyond that, there are a bunch of good practices that you need to follow, um, which you, know, you can almost take as a checklist. And if we take about, you know, we go through some of these fairly quickly, referential integrity. There is a setting when you build a relationship between two tables in Power BI to assume referential integrity. You do that, Power BI is able to use inner joins in the SQL that it generates rather than left out joins. Inner joins will perform better. So if you have referential integrity in your data, which I hope you have, then don't forget to check that box. That will result in a certain amount of um, performance improvement. For Importing data, um, query folding is very important. If you are doing transformations in the Power Query Editor and you're uh, doing some uh, perhaps quite heavy transformations that involve large amounts of data, it's really important that the Power Query Engine inside Power BI can push those transformations back to the source by generating SQL. That's called query folding, and that will happen where possible, but you need to check. So if you're doing any transformations in the Power Query Editor, check that query folding is taking place. If you're doing calculations, you can do a lot of cool stuff with DAX. It is really important that you check that you've written efficient DAX. Writing DAX in calculations in different ways can make a massive difference to performance. 
And it's quite tempting to think that on your small amount of development data, something that maybe takes a couple of seconds to calculate is all right. In the real world, if you're working with larger data volumes and you've got lots of users querying um, your Power BI semantic model at the same time, it becomes really important to get efficient DAX. If you're using direct query, really efficient DAX inside your um, measures in particular is incredibly important. So do not neglect to test your DAX calculations. Next up, there are a bunch of configuration settings, which I will go through very, very quickly. A lot of these are widely documented, but for example, you can control the maximum number of connections that Power BI can make back to a data source. This unsurprisingly has a big impact on how many queries Power BI can generate in parallel. And of course, the number of queries that it can run in parallel is gonna have a big impact on overall performance. So that's available as the maximum number of connections per data source. For import mode semantic models, there is also something called the maximum number of simultaneous evaluations um, or the maximum number of concurrent jobs. For direct query mode in particular, something that's really important and something that's happened more recently is a setting called max parallelism per query. Um, this controls the number of parallel SQL queries that can be generated for a single DAX query rather than all up. So take a look at that. And you know, for all of these settings, have a look around. There are some good blog posts on my blog uh, and on others. And certainly look in the uh, best practices doc documentation we've got on the Microsoft side. And then last of all, report design is really, really important. Reducing the number of visuals on a page, unsurprisingly, reduces the number of queries that go back to the source. It's really important, though, to make the point that reducing the number of visuals on a page does not mean reducing the amount of data on a page. There are a lot of ways in Power BI that you can get the same amount of data with a smaller number of visuals. For example, using small multiples, instead of having four different cards showing four different numbers, you can have one card showing four numbers, then that will reduce the number of DAX queries going back to the semantic model, which in turn will reduce the number of SQL queries going back to Databricks. That can unsurprisingly have a big effect on performance. And when you're building your Power BI reports, there are some built-in settings which are particularly optimized for direct query mode, which will, again, control how many queries get sent back from the report back to the semantic model. These are called the query reduction settings. Um, and you know, there's also, incidentally, some related features where you can say, don't keep generating queries while I'm you know, selecting items in slices or filters. There's a button you can turn on that says, when I'm selecting things, don't send, don't make that selection until I actually finally click that button. These are very easy to miss. They are there in Power BI Desktop when you're building your report. But again, they can make a massive difference to performance because they reduce the number of queries that go back to the semantic model and in direct query mode, reduce the number of queries going back to Databricks. Now, that was a, a whirlwind tour. As I've mentioned, there is great documentation on the Microsoft site about Power BI direct query best practices in particular. So make sure you check that out. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Over to Danny to cover Delta Link. Thank you very much. All right, perfect. Well, uh, obviously, when it comes to me, especially because I'm a slightly biased on Delta Lake, just a tiny bit. If you don't know who I am, I'm one of the maintainers for Delta Lake. So there, there is a slight bit of bias here. I'm going to say the most obvious one. You probably want to use the Delta format. So yes, uh, obviously that will help your cause. I'm not going to go into a sales pitch, so don't worry. I I'm going to presume most of you are trying to figure out how to get Power BI to work well with Databricks. Yes, by default, we're going ahead using Delta format. The first things first, uh, a lot of the stuff, uh, actually, both Chris and I are going to joke quite a bit about, just because we've worked together for such a long time, about what standard star schema, standard OLAP principles, uh, online, online analytical processing, those key contexts come into play. Part of it's just because it actually is super helpful 
within the context of Delta itself. Some of it's just because of the nature of the Power BI engine. Doesn't really matter, honestly. There's pros to almost that approach where even from an engineering consistency perspective, it'll just make your life easier. So for example, that null, not null, when, uh, where possible. Why? Because it just made, you know how the old school OLAP days, we went ahead and shifted everything that was null to negative one? Pretty much, that's exactly the same context. It We follow the same principles that you typically do for data warehousing slash OLAP terminology technologies, okay? Now, let me switch it a little bit to also call out the fact that there's some improvements within Databricks itself. We have the predictive IO engine, i.e. predictive optimization. It's currently in public preview. And what happens there is behind the scenes, underneath the covers, we're optimizing the format, the structure of the way the Delta tables are uh, organized, okay? Ultimately, fundamentally, when we're talking about working with the Delta, or for that matter, any Parquet files in cloud object stores. What we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how to format structure the layout and the size of the files. That's it. Ultimately, it's about a bunch of parquet files sitting in cloud object stores because you're doing ultimately REST API calls, i.e. web calls, you know, good old fashioned gets posts uh, and puts, excuse me. That's actually all we're doing. So how do we get those things in the most optimal way to get it off of ADL Gen 2 into Power BI? Ultimately, that's what it comes down to, okay? Like, there's obviously a bunch of stuff in the in between, but in the end, it's how do I get the data from the Parquet files that are sitting in the ADLS Gen 2? How do I get that to be as streamlined as possible? So if any of you watched an old, old, old video of mine, right, there was the key, key the trick that I did was I would go ahead and create a Hive ODBC connection from SQL Server into basically HDFS, okay? Now, None of us want you to do that, okay? Because none of us want you to go ahead and create an ODBC connection to a file system. That sort of sucks. It was great when we built it back then. And even then, if you told me that wasn't a good idea, honestly, I probably would agree with you. So since we don't have to do that anymore, we can go ahead and figure out ways to basically use machine learning to figure out how to structure said files, how to streamline them. That's what predictive optimization does. That's a long story short. That's as much as I want to get into it because I will rat hole and then Leaping will have to shut me off uh, if I go ahead and tell you exactly what we do underneath the covers. So I won't do that to y'all, okay? Now, included with that is the using auto-optimize. Again, same principle. Another particular context of saying, how do I go ahead and optimize the file size? Oh, I'm going to have a little tag that talks about Z, uh, Z order or Z order for all my British friends, you know, to say it properly, um, to go ahead and actually structure the indexes and how uh, the, uh, what the tail of the parquet files itself goes ahead and its metadata tells on how to query said data, okay? Auto-optimize, again, structures, optimizes the sizes of said files, so that way we can streamline and get the data ultimately from what is ADLS Gen 2 into Power BI, okay? Oh, sorry. Run the analyze table regularly. That sort of pretty much is exactly what it means, okay? In other words, run the particular query so that way you can figure out if it's actually optimized or not. That's it. Analyze the stats, update the stats. Stats are the ways for any query to a Delta table to basically say, oh, okay, I don't need to read every single partition. I don't need to read every single file. I only need to read six of them, okay? And ultimately, again, just like I started in the beginning, it's about how do I streamline so there's less files for me to read and I can then streamline them into Power BI. Helps from both the import perspective and also direct query. A lot of time people want to talk about within the context of direct query because they're saying, I want to know what the exact value is right now. I don't want to wait. I don't want to import it in because I got too much data to, to go with. But whatever approach uh, you want to use, whether it's direct query or import, doesn't matter it actually will improve said performance to get the data from ADLS Gen 2 to Power BI. And then of course, I also um, implied that right before, Z ordering, okay? Or Z ordering for my for, uh, for all of us Yankees here, okay? Basically, it allows us to go ahead and in traditionally, when you talk about, for example, a good old fashioned SQL Server database, you're talking about, hey, I want to do clustered indexes. I want to go ahead and structure the files in a particular way so that way I can find exactly which file to query. Well, what Z ordering or Z ordering does is it allows you to basically do that 
without actually needing to create an actual clustered index. Think of it taking the advantage of a non-clustered index from SQL Server, except the fact that because the statistics are that precise and you're talking about the type of um, multiple keys, i.e. multiple dimensions of being able to go ahead and query from different domains and different dimensions, that's what exactly what that ordering does. And so the whole point is that if you have a particular set of keys, typically you're talking about five to seven keys that you typically will join on or do selected queries, enable it. So that way, the clustering that's automatically provided by Z ordering, it'll actually go ahead and result in less files, less data that needs to go from Delta to Power BI, and then you're good to go. And then, uh, oh, actually, I thought we had something else. Okay, avoid partitioning data for less than one terabyte. Yeah, basically, what it boils down to is typically the file size of a Parquet file for any cloud object store. You want to stick to somewhere between 256 megs to 700. Fifty six megs up to a gig, okay? Because if you have supposedly too many partitions, okay, what ends up happening is that that means all the files themselves become super small. So then also now you're having a bunch of like fifty k, hundred k small files. It's the traditional small file problem. Remember when you're querying something like ADLs Gen two or any cloud object store, what you're ultimately doing is you're doing these again these REST API calls, these web calls. Well, that means that the overhead of calling said files, because you've got so many small ones, is actually takes longer than the actual querying of the files. So that's actually why we're trying to basically find that right balance, which is, again, why to vote partitioning for data less than one terabyte. Now, I believe I just saw a question that popped in and says, hey, but should, does that imply you should use liquid clustering? Why, yes, it does. That's exactly what you should do, because liquid clustering takes that same concept of Z ordering to the next level, which is you don't actually have to partition data at all. What we do is we actually understand how to re sure, reorganize the parquet files using various indices to be able to go ahead and scan, only look at the metadata initially to figure out exactly which set of files you need, and then look at the tail of the parquet files, uh, the footer of the parquet files to figure out if they are actually matching. So the whole point is you want to reduce the amount of false negatives. In other words, you get the list of files from metadata. You want to basically say, do I need to create everything there or do I only need to create a subset of there? The whole point is that the metadata itself is less likely to give you a set of files where you actually are querying data that you don't need. Again, everything I'm talking about is basically trying to restructure, reorganize, uh, so that way the least amount of data is being extracted from your cloud object store and sent to Power BI. Okay? And, oh, sorry. Uh, and avoid using Y data types. Okay? Now, this is actually both a Delta problem and a Power BI problem. Why is it? Because in the end, when you're talking about wide data types, are you going to aggregate against that? Are you going to sum it? Are you going to distinct count it? Are you doing anything that's remotely aggregate friendly when you're dealing with wide data types? I'm not saying that scenario doesn't exist. I'm just simply saying 95% plus of the time you're not doing that. And so because of that, you really don't want to, for example, go ahead and do a count or summation of a bunch of arrays. That seems like a bad idea, all right? So sort of the same concept comes into the Remember, when you have a wide data type, that means that column store is taking up memory. That means it's taking up memory when we extract the data from uh, the Delta table. And it's also trying to then convey that information, that, that, that much memory into Power BI. So we're uselessly basically putting all this information into Power BI memory to go ahead and query that. So basically it's bad for everybody, right? And so that's what we're trying to avoid. So basically in general, avoid that context, okay? So that's the real call out for, uh, uh, for Power BI. I did want to call out, uh, sorry, for Delta Lake in terms of performance, I did want to call some really cool differentiators. Now, these are, ironically, these are numbers from two years ago. Uh, you can then claim that, Denny, is it because you're too lazy to update? Yes, yes, that is absolutely true. I am too lazy to update the slides because it requires me to actually go query the systems to get the latest numbers. So I am lazy. By the same token, I think that the numbers from two years ago are still pretty cool, okay? Which is that within Databricks, we actually go ahead and process, not just store, process more, and the, again, two years ago number, 1.7 exabytes of data a day. 
Okay, we process that much. 663% increased contributor strength over the last three years for Delta Lake. Uh, more than 7,000 companies, again, this is numbers from two years ago, companies in production with Delta Lake. That's why we are telling you all this stuff for all you Power BI users. Because guess what? Lots of companies are all doing this. They're processing their data in it. They're going ahead and using the services of Power BI and Delta Lake to go ahead and actually improve the poor performance of their queries also to the point where now they're even contributing to Delta, which is awesome because the more people who contribute, the better. That's what an open source project is. So just want to call that out. These, the key differentiations are not just performance, but community and reliability. Okay. Uh, oops, sorry. I'm trying to, change it oh and this is just a quick call out. again a number from two years ago you notice that th now again this is november 2022 uh yeah 22 yeah <laughs> sorry i can't even read my own slide um and i wrote it so this is how, how, how brutal it becomes but you'll notice that again i didn't bother updating it mainly because at that at this point we're already past the point of me caring 11.1 million downloads a month this is just the open source stuff not even the databricks stuff right where we're basically going ahead and saying uh we have contributions with kafka for presto delta rust which is one of our most popular projects uh flink um and the continually updates of Delta. So we're constantly taking all those optimizations, making sure it's useful for Delta itself, and also that way it's useful for the uh, within Databricks and within the open source community at the exact same time. Cool. And sorry, I'm trying to change the slide. There we go. Oh, three real quick use case studies to showcase the how cool it is for example in the case of comcast uh, they presented this back in 2018 they uh, they had petabyte scale jobs their their sessionization with delta lake long story short the, the key things i want you to remember from this one 10x lower compute because they went ahead and ran structure streaming with delta lake they were able to get from 640 vms down to 64 and they because they're also using structure streaming they went from simpler and faster etl they went from 84 jobs down to three and half the data latency, which you have to admit is pretty cool. All right, uh, ABN Amro, a financial company, 10 times faster time to market, hundreds of use cases, 500 plus empowered users to basically run their analytics all in Delta Lake. And, oh, sorry, final tidbit, I think. Yes, uh, this is from the 2018 keynote. Apple obviously is running uh, with Delta Lake. Dominic Brzezinski came on stage with Michael Armbrust, 3.6 million records per second input rate, 3.4 million records per second processing rate, greater than 100 terabytes new data a day, three, greater than 300 billion events. The most query table is 1.15 trillion rows. And this, these are numbers from 2018. So hopefully this sort of hammers the point across that, yes, that's why we want Power BI to talk to Delta Lake because it provides that reliability that you guys want. So boom. Um, all right. Yep. I think that's it for me. So thank you very much. Thank you, Danny. Now, Marius is going to cover Daysbreak SQL. Brilliant. You thank you, Liping. Great. Thank you. So we covered Power BI on one side and how to make that awesome. We covered the Delta Lake and how to make that awesome on the other side. I'm going to spend a bit of time to just cover the bit in the middle, which is the, the Databricks compute, if you are using Databricks. So the first thing on on from my a bit and potentially if you only remember one thing from my presentation is this one. Uh, Liping, if you could move to oh no, I'm good. Is make sure you use a SQL warehouse uh, as the type of compute instead of the all-purpose compute. So these are different types of compute within the Databricks environment. The all-purpose compute has been around for longer. So there's still quite a lot of customers that are using all-purpose compute when connecting from Power BI to Databricks. And what we're saying here is the SQL warehouse is just better. So you should seriously consider using that instead. So the SQL warehouse is a type of Spark cluster that is just optimized for high concurrency, low latency, and the type of performance and SLAs you would expect from BI workloads in general and Power BI in particular. Uh, it also helps that there's a number of AI-driven innovations and improvements that only land in the SQL warehouse, so capabilities that you don't have available in the all-purpose cluster. And from a UI perspective, the, the Databricks SQL warehouse interface is a lot more simplified. When you create a cluster, it's a lot simpler to figure out what you're doing. It's a lot more familiar for people coming from a data warehousing database background to know exactly what's happening there without having to worry about a Databricks runtime or the size of a driver, the size of a worker. 
so on. Now, tied to that, the second bit is, my apologies, is if you are going to use a SQL warehouse, use a serverless SQL warehouse. So when you create a warehouse, you pretty much can create it as serverless or as classic. If you create it as classic, there are going to be there is going to be some delay when you start the warehouse, when you scale out the warehouse, when you resize it, you're going to have to wait a few minutes. And that might be quite detrimental when we're talking about Power BI, when we're talking about people browsing reports, interacting with the data, expecting a really, really qu quick responsiveness. With serverless, you can do all this uh, operations within seconds. So you can start your warehouse, you can scale it out. Also, in addition to this, which gives you a lot of agility, all the or a, a lot of the innovation that's coming out of Databricks in this space is landing in the SQL serverless tier. So you will have more options, you'll have more capabilities than in the non-non-serverless one. Uh, it's worth mentioning that changing from serverless to classic and back is really simple. You're just changing a toggle. So if you decide to try serverless and for whatever reason you don't like it, it's really easy to switch back. So it, it's very easy and it's not just a one-way street. Moving on, one thing that's quite important is scaling out. You need to scale out your warehouse and you can scale it in two directions. You can scale it out and you can scale it up in order to be able to maintain those SLAs and make sure that your Power BI users have a really good experience. Now, a rule of thumb is you scale out for concurrency. So when you have lots of queries coming from Power BI, then you should consider scaling out. So if you become a victim of your own success and your Power BI uh, reports get huge adoption, and now you have lots and lots of queries, it's pretty easy to just scale out your warehouse. What happens behind the scenes, we now have multiple warehouses instead of just one working behind the scenes, sharing the load. It's all transparent to Power BI and to the end user. They won't know anything has changed, but we can keep serving the, the queries quickly, even though there's going to be a lot of them. Now, if your workloads are going to be hard to predict, you don't know when you're going to get that huge spike of queries. It might be on a Monday morning. It might be sometimes during the day. Then auto-scaling can, can be a quite, a quite a good option here. And when you use this together with SQL Serverless, then it takes seconds for a warehouse to become two, three, four, five, to just adapt to the query patterns, to the spikes, so you can keep the performance up. And then as this, that spike disappears, then it just goes back to just the one warehouse that you started with initially. The other type of scaling that I mentioned is scaling up. So that happens usually when you have a large amount of data that you're querying, you have to process, you might have really, really complex transformations and your queries are just taking a long time. That's when you might wanna consider making your warehouse bigger as opposed to just having multiple warehouses working together to handle concurrency. A good rule of thumb, if you don't already know and you haven't done some testing to figure out what size of warehouse you want, is to start with medium. We find it works for most BI workloads, but then we have good uh, query, query monitoring so that you can track where your queries might be slow and then decide, is this a problem that I can optimize on the Delta Lake side, in Power BI side, or is this something that I just need a bigger warehouse? And then you can uh, upgrade from medium to large, extra large, and so on. Okay, now this is a pretty trivial one, but in order to take advantage of the, the cloud in general and serverless in particular, make sure that you examine the auto stop uh, feature. So with serverless, it's quite easy. If your warehouse is not utilized, nobody's querying it, there is no need for you to have it running there incurring costs. So with auto stop, after 10, 15, five minutes, it can just go to sleep. Then the first query hits it, it comes back in a few seconds, it's serving queries again. Then if you have auto scaling, that it can potentially scale out in order to serve the peak and then go back to sleep. It's quite a nice pattern that can be implemented. I believe right now you can go as low as five minutes in terms of uh, the auto stop. Okay, now, Within, if you're using the SQL warehouse, we have a really nice query history that's just there baked into the, the Databricks UI. And then you can see all the queries that are hitting one or multiple warehouses that you might have running. You can easily order by the time it takes for those queries to run. So it makes it quite easy and a quite a pleasant experience to just monitor, see which one might be taking longer. 
then you just zoom in on that, get a nice explain plan, and then again, figure out where do you need to optimize? Do you go on the Delta side? Do you go on the Power BI side? Or do you just want to, to resize or respec your, your warehouse? Now this is available in the UI. You can consume this information via API. We're also making this available as a system table that comes as part of Unity Catalog. I believe this is in private preview right now, but the idea here is it allows you to just deal with this in a more programmatic way. You can build your own reports on top of this query history, track whatever is important to you, or build proactive alerts. Anytime there's a query over a certain threshold, just send a Teams message or send an SMS to someone to just go have a look so that the, the performance degradation doesn't become a surprise. It's not your end users coming back and complaining from, from the Power BI side. Now this one, Chris already mentioned, but it, it's super important. So I have it on my slide as well. Make sure that Power BI does push down the heavy calculations, the joins, the work clauses to Databricks itself. If you're using Databricks, you're probably operating on, on large-ish amounts of data. So you want to make to take advantage of that big, chunky Spark uh, engine in order to do the data crunching and only return the, the results to, to Power BI. Just a few more here. So this is one for a lot of people that might be coming from a SQL server background or similar where you uh, are used to thinking that, okay, I have one warehouse, I need to right size it in a way that multiple people, multiple workloads can coexist without one group of people potentially cannibalizing the, the resources of another. And that's fine. But within Databricks with this, de de this decoupling between compute and storage, it's perfectly accessible, uh, acceptable to have multiple warehouses working on the same data, serving different business units that are using Power BI to build their reports or potentially just different types of reports. You might have reports that go to the whole business, have very strict SLAs. You might want to give them a dedicated warehouse and then have another for your ad hoc users that are just going in Power BI and slicing and dicing the data to find inside. If you combine this with SQL serverless, then you're still only keeping up warehouses, but the warehouses for the amount of time you actually need them. So having multiple of them becomes a lot more feasible. Materialized views is something that Databricks released quite recently. I believe it's still in preview right now, but it's just a way to avoid doing complex joins, complex calculations multiple times. You can just have a view that gets materialized and keeps kept is kept up to date in a smart incremental way of at times so that Power BI then ends up just hitting that materialized view. Databricks is much faster at returning the data. You avoid a lot of unnecessary computation to just recompute those joins, recompute that, that logic. And then the last one I have is there's a lot of scenarios where uh, people might have a lot of data in Databricks in the Delta format, but then when they're using Power BI, they also want to enrich that with some data that might sit in SQL Server or in Synapse or in Google BigQuery. And sure, you can do that directly in Power BI because Power BI has a rich ecosystem of connectors. You can connect to those two data sources and do the join to the aggregation in Power BI. But if we're dealing with large amounts of data, that might not be the best use of Power BI's resources. The one thing that you can use quite easily is this capability of Lakehouse Federation, where you pretty much federate or plug in a SQL Server, a Google BigQuery, a Synapse within Databricks directly. And then those tables just appear as normal tables in Databricks. And it doesn't look any different to Power BI. It doesn't look any different to an end user. But you can now use Power BI to push down those joins to Databricks. And then Databricks is going to figure out how to join the data between the Delta uh, tables and what might be sitting in, in SQL Server and also use the, the Databricks capabilities and compute power to compute that, that uh, join, that aggregation before returning it to Power BI. And that's all I had. So back to you, Liping. Cool, thank you, Marius. Um, now, um, if you follow all those things that Chris, Danny, and Marius said, you should have a very performant uh, Power BI report on top of Databricks, but you also want to make sure that uh, you have proper access control and networking security in place to um, safeguard and make sure that your end users are accessing the data in Databricks in a secure fashion. 
So first thing with access control is Power BI together with Databricks need to know who's accessing the data and what they have access to. When it comes to authentication, you have three different methods uh, for Power BI to authenticate to Databricks. Username and password, personal access token, and OAuth. Um, it's worth noting that they're called differently in Power BI Desktop versus Power BI Service. So for Power BI Service, they are called Basic, Key, and OAuth. And if you're using Azure Databricks Connector, your OAuth will be called Azure Active Directory. This is because AAD is the default OAuth mechanism that Azure Databricks uses. And if you're using the generic Databricks connector, then an OAuth will be called OIDC in desktop. A few things worth noting um, using different authentication methods. First is username and passwords does not support MFA or uh, 2FA. So for majority of the organization today in the world will require MFA. And um, so then essentially this becomes a bit of a legacy kind of authentication method. You might not be able to use it if your organization requires MFA. With a uh, cat, which is also personal access token, it uh, can be used for all of the cloud and it pretty much can be used for all of the scenarios, including service principles. And this is because something like OAuth will require interactive logging, which is not available for service principle. But uh, as per Databricks best practice, you should set a expiration date for your personal access token. This is because it's not safe for you to have a key that doesn't have an expiration date that lies around. If it ends up in the wrong hand, then your secure access is jeopardized. And if you have an expiration key for your personal access token, you will need to do key rotation. And it's best practice to, to bake that key rotation um, as part of your CICD process for Power BI. The last and probably is most frequently used authentication method is OAuth. Um, this is worth noting that if you're using um, Databricks on top of AWS and you're using AAD, we rolled out uh, recently the AAD pass-through for Databricks on AWS. In order to use that, you will need to set a account level SSO, enable that first before you can use AAD pass-through. Um, this is for the guys who come from Databricks backgrounds and might not be familiar with the authentication flow of Databricks. Um, just to cover the basics, if you're a Power BI developer and you're accessing Databricks using Power BI desktop, What's going to happen is you're going to authenticate using your personal account uh, using one of the three authentication methods, and it will hit SQL Warehouse. SQL Warehouse will check with Unity Catalog, you as a user, what do you have access to, certain rows, certain tables, certain columns, and then return the results accordingly. At that point, uh, you will build your model, build your report, and publish to Power BI. Once the semantic model is published to Power BI, you will then go edit the data source credentials using, again, one of the three authentication methods. And this credential typically is not your personal account. Typically, it's an account that you want Power BI to use to do the data refreshes for import mode or direct query or potentially you want to set up uh, AAD pass-through for your end user's identity to be passed through to, Power, uh, to Databricks. So here's the different scenarios. You do your data engineering and transformation going from bronze to silver to gold, and typically Power BI is consuming the data in gold. And your if you have anything like import, composite model aggregations, or hybrid data sets, typically you set up a service account for Power BI to do the refreshes. And that service account is different from a service principle. Service account is actually a user principle. For instance, uh, you would provision a user principle in your AAD, and that's called Power BI refresh at your company.com. 
And that service principle doesn't belong to anyone. That means if you leave your organization, that service principle is still alive and can still refresh the Power BI data set. And because you're using a service account to talk to Databricks uh, SQL Warehouse, as far as Databricks is concerned, it's the service account um, access control that SQL Warehouse needs to check with Unity Catalog with. So it'll give um, the Power BI query whatever the service account has access to. And then if you want to do access control for your end users in Power BI to say this particular group have access to the US data, that particular group have access to the Australia data, that role level security need to be set up in Power BI. Same thing if you are using direct query and you can still use service accounts for Power BI to talk to the SQL Warehouse, SQL Warehouse checks Unity Catalog, for the service accounts uh, access for tables, rows, and columns. And you can set up the access control in Power BI to control which group has access to what data um, within Power BI uh, itself. And then some people think, okay, I don't want a dual security model. I don't want to set up Unity Catalog for access control, then Power BI for access control. I want Unity Catalog to govern everything. And then in this scenario, what you can do is to set up a direct query um, data set in Power BI or semantic model in Power BI and do all off in Power BI. There is a toggle that says report viewers will only access data source using their Power BI identity through direct query. You toggle that Power BI will pass down the AAD identity to Databricks uh, SQL Warehouse. SQL Warehouse will check Unity Catalog whether that uh, AD identity have access to certain tables, certain views, certain columns, and pass back the, the query results. In reality, what you're going to have is a combination of these scenarios. It's very rarely um, that you have a company that has 100% of their sem semantic model or in direct query. Uh, or 100% of um, uh, their data set or in import mode. You're likely going to have a combination of these scenarios and you're likely going to set up security or access control in both Power BI and Unity Catalog. And in terms of what Unity Catalog can carry through to Power BI, you can govern the uh, access to tables, to rows. Row filters is equivalent to traditional uh, row level security. You can mask columns for sensitive data, and also you can build dynamic views and that whatever dynamic views is allowing the users to see will carry through to Power BI. Again, these are only available if you're using direct query with a deep pass through. Quickly, we have a few minutes left. Just wanted to cover networking security as well. You will only need a gateway if you have front end private link or IP access list enabled in your Databricks workspace. If you have something just back end only private link, you don't need a gateway. And you have two choices for gateway. One is VNet gateway, which is newly GA from uh, Microsoft. It's a managed solution, so you don't have to worry about maintenance, and it's a premium only feature. Versus the on-prem gateway, which is a traditional way of setting up a data gateway hosted on a VM, you do need to maintain that VM yourself, but it's also fully controlled by you, so you can set up scaling and uh, load balancing if you want. I think that we have one minute left on the um, webinar. Thank you very much. We'll see if we can answer some of the questions. Is there a inherently potential conflict between composite model and ski, ski, uh, star schema? Like you might want one fact table to be direct queried and another to be imported. Chris, you want to take that? Sure. Um, no, I don't think there's any conflict at all. Um, star schema is all about how your data is modeled. Composite models are all about how your data is stored. So they're, they're totally orthogonal. Um, if that's the right word, <laughs> I know it's a tech term, um, topics, you know, how the data stored has got nothing to do with how it's modeled. 
Thank you, Chris. And, and Dennis also asked, I turned down predictive optimization yesterday. I hasn't run a vacuum or optimized yet. How frequent are the jobs uh, run for predictive optimization? Is that a question for Danny? Sorry, I'm trying to unmute myself. Actually, uh, Maris, by any chance, do you know this one better? Because I actually don't recall the frequency, at least in this case, the frequency of how often those are run. They should be run regularly, but I actually don't remember the exact uh, time frame. I do not, and I'm not going to risk speculating because uh, this is recorded, okay. but we are going to follow up with, with the answer and any questions we, we can't uh, take just because of time limitations. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks, Mary. Sorry about that. I wasn't trying to roll you under the bus. I, I literally <laughs> forgot, and I thought maybe you knew. That's all. <laughs> yep. My bad. Cool. All good. We have a lot of questions in the chat, which I don't think we have time for because we're overrunning by one minute. But what we'll do is we will record all these questions and try to get back to you on LinkedIn, if that's OK. Um, thank you very much for spending the last 50 minutes with us. And hopefully this session was useful. Please give us feedback uh, if you can, so we can improve for next webinars. Thank you very much. And uh, see you next time. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you all.